It is now time for oral questions. I recognize the Leader of Her Majesty's Loyal Opposition. Well, thank you uh, very much, Mr. Speaker. My uh, question is for the uh, Premier. Back in 2019, uh, the Premier said, and I quote, I spoke to childcare folks and they can't afford to hire people because of the minimum wage. But in fact, it's because of the Premier's low wage policy that we can't get workers in childcare, Speaker. Without a childcare deal, Wages for child care workers will not increase in this province. Child care workers, like everyone else, are facing a higher-than-ever cost of living in this province, and a deal would go a long way to helping them earn the earnings that they need and deserve uh, to build a good life in this province. So my question to the Premier is, why does he think that child care workers should be paid the minimum as part of his low-wage policy, and is that why he's holding up the child care deal? With the federal government. To respond to the government, the Minister of Education. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. On the contrary, the government is committed to getting a good deal, a fair deal for the people of this province. What we are asking members opposite to do is stand with the people of this province to extract a better deal, more sustainable, with a higher level of investment from the federal government. We recognize childcare costs are too high for too many families in this province. It was a legacy of the former Liberal government that is unacceptable, 40 per cent above the national average. The Premier in this government has invested every single year to build new spaces, 30,000 spaces with a billion-dollar allocation, and make childcare more affordable through the introduction of the Ontario Child Care Tax Credit opposed by the Democrats and Liberals in this House. We're going to stand up for affordability. We're going to urge the federal government to invest in this province and make child care affordable for the people we serve. A supplementary question. Well, Speaker, the Premier got involved, and apparently that's why we can't seem to get a deal here in Ontario. He hasn't mentioned the word, word childcare in this legislature since February the 18th, the year 2000, one year and nine months ago. His low-wage policy is what his priority is. He should be negotiating a deal for all of the families who need childcare in this province so that life can be more affordable for them, because we all know the cost of childcare is exorbitant because of the way the Liberals handled childcare when they were in office. When childcare can cost as much as a mortgage payment Order. in this province, why won't the Premier do the right thing, get his, get his deal in place, get a deal in place for, so that people will be able to afford childcare? Care and have a bit of relief from the rising Question. cost of living in this province. Minister of Education. Thank you, Speaker. Where the member opposite and I agree is that the former Liberal government uh, left a unacceptable and indefensible legacy of unaffordable childcare that is inaccessible in virtually all regions of this province. We must do better. And it was this government and premier who, in our first budget, introduced the Ontario Child Care Tax Credit, which provides roughly $1,500 per child in savings. Most regrettably, the Liberals and New Democrats did not think that affordable childcare was important, which is regrettable that they opposed it. But for conservatives, for progressive conservatives, we're going to continue to make the case to the, to the federal Liberal government that the program they've offered does not get us to $10, does not deliver a sustainable program that will ensure affordability for decades to come. We want a good deal. We want a fair deal for the people we serve. We're asking all members to stand with Ontario, stand with families to get a better deal from this federal Liberal government. And the final supplementary. Speaker, BC got a child care deal on July 8th, four months ago, more than four months ago. Quebec, August the 5th. Manitoba, August the 9th. Saskatchewan, August the 13th. Alberta, this week. There's no doubt, I think we would all agree, fees went sky high under the Liberal government. But They've continued to go up even further under this government as we lose spaces. Meanwhile, families are left struggling, Speaker, and they are waiting, waiting in anxiety as to what the future holds in terms of this very expensive program that they could get some relief on if this government did its job. Even the Conservative governments around the country and other provinces have managed to get a deal with the federal government. Why is not-for-profit, public, affordable, universal child care not a priority for this Conservative Premier? Minister of Education. 
Speaker, our priority is to get a fair share for the people of Ontario. Our priority is to stand up to the federal Liberal government, who we believe is shortchanging Ontario families and parents by not providing the investment our uh, constituents deserve. Uh, our message to the federal government, who contributes currently 2.5 per cent of the child care program in this province, is that the program on the table, the offer on the table, is insufficient. We look forward to discussing this with the feds to get a deal, to land a better deal that is fair for our families, that will ensure affordability and $10 a day childcare. This province invests significantly in a very comprehensive childcare program, in addition to the uh, all-day kindergarten program that supports early learning for four and five-year-olds. We want the feds to recognize our investment, work with us to get a deal that ensures affordability for all families in all regions of this province. Thank you. The next question, once again, the Leader of the Opposition. Thank you so much, Speaker. Speaker, my next question is also for the Premier. You know, the people of Brampton know exactly how crowded Brampton Civic and Peel Memorial are. They're the ones that wait in pain for hours and hours on end to get the health care services that they need. For, for years and years, this has been their experience. They're the ones that have faced years of hallway medicine with no privacy, with no dignity, and in many cases without even an access, access to a nurse when they need one. This Premier, just like the Liberals before him, are shortchanging Brampton yet again with just 250 beds and no 24-hour emergency care services at Peel Memorial. Liberals wasted 15 years not supporting Brampton. Why is this Premier not delivering the 850 beds that City Councillors have called for Question. by upgrading Peel Memorial to a full-service hospital and building a new third hospital that Brampton and Bramptonians desperately need? To reply, the Premier. And through you, Mr. Speaker, I can assure the people of Brampton that we're standing up for them after 15 years of being ignored under the NDP and Liberals, they're finally getting a brand new hospital with a 24-7 emergency room. And let me let me just quote the uh, mayor of Brampton said recently: Brampton got nothing for two decades. For 20 years, we were ignored, despite having institutionalized hallway medicine. Frankly, this should have been done 15 years ago under your watch and under the Liberals' watch. It was totally ignored. We're getting a billion dollars, the largest investment in healthcare in our city's history. This is a significant step forward. This is progress, and I don't think there's any mayor in. Canada that would not be elated with a billion dollar investment in their community that was quoted by Mayor Patrick Brown Response. and everyone in, in Brampton is quite happy with the new hospital for the 24-7. I'll remind members to make their comments through the chair. Supplementary question. Thank you so much. Speaker, Speaker, Brampton declared a health care emergency, a health care emergency back in 2020 before COVID-19 even hit. During the pandemic, over 550 patients had to be transferred out because the hospital had become so overwhelmed. Peel Memorial's urgent care centre is already seeing far, far more patients than it was ever even built for. And as we all know, Brampton Civic, because of the Conservative government at the time, opened its doors, uh, and at the minute those doors were open, it was overwhelmed at that point. It was over capacity because of the conservative decisions in that initial hospital. Look, De Brampton desperately needs a new ER. They need two new ERs. They need the kind of services that they have desperately Order. waited for for two decades under conservative and liberal watches. Question. So why is this Premier saying no? Why doesn't he change the fall economic statement and include the necessary funding for Peel Memorial upgrade and a third Brampton hospital? Deputy Premier and Minister of Health. Thank you very much. Well, this, the situation arose in Brampton because of 15 years of inactivity yeah, by the yeah. Gwen Del Duca Liberals propped up by Order. the NDP. But well, we're not doing that. Order. We're standing up for the people of Brampton, and we are there for them. That's why we are saying yes to a new hospital that will provide over 250 new patient beds and include a 24-7 emergency department. They've already received $1.5 million to support planning for this emergency department, which is going to open very soon. In addition, as part of our comprehensive Keeping Ontarians Safe plan, William Osler, 
operating the hospital received more than $17 million in funding to operate 87 net new acute medical surgical beds to alleviate surge pressures. So we are there for the people of Brampton, unlike the McGinty Wynn Liberals. Del Duca win as well, M Premier McGinty as well. Totally ignored Brampton. We will not. Thank you. The final supplementary. Well, Speaker, there is no doubt that uh, that this Conservative government can't change history and Order. can't uh, do an, uh, a redo of the failure of the last Conservative government here in Ontario. But what we can do is amend the fall economic statement and build the hospitals that Brampton needs now and that I think we all agree they've needed for decades. Instead of committing to untold billions and billions of dollars to highways designed to make the Premier's buddies rich, next week we can be voting on a motion, we will be voting on a motion actually, to support the new Brampton hospitals that the good people of Brampton desperately, desperately need. So my question to the Premier is, will he and his government support our motion, say yes, say yes to the people of Brampton, and finally build the desperately needed hospitals that they need? Mr. Speaker, the, the facts are the opposition have said no to the largest health care investment in Brampton's history. They voted no. They voted no to historic hospital infrastructure investment in Brampton. They voted no to part with $5.1 billion to support hospitals, creating more than 3,100 additional hospital beds, equivalent of six large community hospitals. The opposition voted no to more than $1 billion for Ontario's COVID vaccination campaign. They voted no to more than $3.7 billion on Ontario's comprehensive testing strategy, and they voted no to add additional $175 million this year for mental health and addiction services. There are party of no, we're a party of yes. We're moving the province forward. The next question, the member for University of Rosedale. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. A new report from the National Bank of Canada shows that it is nearly impossible for a family in Toronto to afford a home. They must now save for an average of 28 years for a down payment and earn $205,000 a year to make the mortgage payment. And even then, a first-time home buyer is likely to be outbid by an investor because investors and multiple property owners are now the highest segment of buyers in Canada's real estate market. And what is this government's response to this housing affordability crisis? They announced in the fall economic statement that they want to study the problem. Premier, a study is not going to help people pay the rent. A study isn't going to help a family buy their first home. This government has made it very clear that big speculators come first in Ontario and home buyers Question. and renters, they go to the back of the line. Premier, what is your plan to clamp down on a housing speculation and help first-time home buyers? I'll remind members to make their comments through the chair to reply on behalf of the government, Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Thanks very much, Speaker. Our, our government's priority is to put affordable home ownership in reach for more Ontarians. That's why, prior to the pandemic, we introduced More Homes, More Choice, our housing supply action plan, which, by the way, that member opposite did not support. Oh. What were the results of that action plan, Speaker? Well, let me tell you this. In the middle of the pandemic, even regardless of the pandemic, our housing supply action plan resulted in over 73,000 home starts wow. in 2020 oh, alone. Speaker, that's the highest single year in the last decade. We've had a record uh, purpose-built rental construction starts in, in the province. You go back and you use CMHC figures, we haven't seen that type of construction since 1992, Speaker. But what we do is we know we're in a severe housing supply shortage. We need to continue to build upon our, our More Homes, More Choice plan. So that's why, in the fall economic statement, we announced a housing affordability task force. We know housing affordability is out of reach for too many Ontarians, and we're prepared to build upon our previous plan, here, here, Speaker. Here, here. And the supplementary question. Uh, thank you, Speaker, and it's good that the issue of housing supply is being raised. A new report by the OECD shows that Canada has 1.3 million homes sitting vacant right now, at a time when Canada has 235,000 people experiencing homelessness. I'll do the math for you. That is five vacant homes 
for every person looking for just one. Wow. We have a housing affordability crisis. We have renters struggling to find an affordable home because rent is now $1,800 a month for a one-bedroom apartment. If this government is so committed to improving and increasing supply, will you do what the experts and the NDP recommend and raise revenue for affordable housing and increase housing supply by bringing in a fair vacant home tax? Again, the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Well, again, speaking, we've, we've been very clear. The Housing Affordability Task Force will look at a wide variety of suggestions and options. In addition, the Premier and I are committed to sitting down with our municipal partners because all three levels of government have a role in housing affordability. We, we've committed uh, with the federal government. Again, I'm still waiting for that member opposite to support our call to the federal government for our fair share. We're, we're short in the national housing strategy based on our core housing needs, some $490 million. $490 million that our local municipal partners could use to build housing rapidly now. Again, Speaker, we're the party to say yes, we want the federal government to give us more. Continually, the NDP keeps saying no. Next question, the member for Niagara West. Thank you very much, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Infrastructure, and I wish to thank the Minister, uh, Speaker, for coming to my riding, making important investments in our local community infrastructure and in healthcare infrastructure. But what we've really seen as well is that the pandemic has uh, shown how de demonstrated how important it is for people and businesses to have access to reliable and high-quality uh, internet. What we've seen is that the Ontario Liberal government, when they were in office, did very, very little, the bare minimum, to invest in broadband capacity so that businesses could compete in the global economy efficiently and successfully. So, que my question to the Minister of Infrastructure, through you, Mr. Speaker, is if the Minister can tell what our government has been doing to ensure that Ontarians have access to high-speed internet so they can get on an equal footing with the rest of the modern world. Minister of Infrastructure to reply. Mr. Speaker, I want the people of Ontario to know that we have a plan and funding in place to ensure that residents in every corner of the province have access to reliable, high-speed internet. We have committed to 100% connectivity no matter where in Ontario you live or work by the end of 2025. In April 2021, we passed the Building Broadband Faster Act legislation that will help remove barriers for service providers to deploy high-speed internet infrastructure. Our government is investing nearly $4 billion, which is the single largest investment in high-speed internet made by any government in Canadian history. Through our ICON program, our $1.2 billion joint investment with the federal government, our reverse auction and our investment in low-earth satellite technology, no one will be left behind. Supplementary question. Thank you very much, Speaker. And I know that the minister's investments have made a substantial difference in the lives of so many of my constituents, especially in the southern uh, part of Niagara, through Pelham and Waynefleet and West Lincoln. The actions that have been taken are helping to boost uh, productivity and ensure that life is easier for the people of Niagara West. It seems like a no-brainer to me, but the NDP voted against the Building Broadband Faster Act. Even though they're quick to point out that we need to do uh, more to ensure that we're investing in isolated communities, they're not willing to support the legislation that makes sure we're able to build this crucial infrastructure. They know how critical the access to reliable high-speed internet is, yet they continue to vote against legislation that aims to achieve connectivity for all. So my question, Speaker, is could the minister tell us more about what the government is doing to support communities with broadband infrastructure in the north and rural communities and across Ontario? Minister of Infrastructure. Mr. Speaker, can you imagine how difficult it must have been for families to go through COVID without having access to high-speed internet? Understanding that this was an existing challenge well before COVID, one of our first investments was in 2018 through the Northern Ontario Heritage Fund Corporation, which funded eight projects in Northern Ontario. In October 2019, our government announced an investment of $30 million in the Matawa High-Speed Internet Project that will benefit more than 670 homes. In January 2020, we invested $10.9 million to support broadband infrastructure in several towns and First Nation communities across the north. We anticipate great coverage and connections from our reverse auction, which is already underway, but just to make sure even the most remote communities are connected. We secured bandwidth capacity by investing $109 million into Telesat Satellite Project. When our government says we will connect everyone, we mean it. 
Next question, the member for Ottawa Centre. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. The residents of Kempville, my neighbours in eastern Ontario, are furious with a rush plan to build a 253-bed prison in their town. There was a consultation last night, Speaker. It was quite the gong show. I understand the MPP for the area was there. The community asked the consultation, what are the projected costs for the wastewater system, road, and other upgrades? They heard, uh, I don't know yet, but we'll work with the municipality on that one. Were other sites considered, the residents asked. Can you provide us with a full list? Crickets, no answer. What about policing costs? What about the fact that Kempville doesn't have an active public transit system to help families connect with incarcerated loved ones? No answer. Premier, are you, are you content that the residents of Kempville, Ontario have been properly consulted on this plan? And do you believe that people in Kempville know what this prison will do to their community? Once again, please make your comments through the chair. To reply, the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Thanks, Speaker. I'm, I'm pleased to reply. I was uh, on the call last night, uh, the Zoom call that the Ministry of Solicitor General uh, had in that community, uh, as we have the ongoing engagement on the uh, on the Eastern Ontario Correctional Complex. Uh, as the member might not know, uh, the announcement uh, that was made in August of 2020 uh, was for a, a, a wide variety of uh, expansions in our correctional bundle, uh, including. Uh, a replacement of the Brockville Jail, something myself and the people of Brockville uh, have been asking for many, many years. And in, uh, in addition, an expansion to the St. Lawrence Valley Treatment Center. Uh, the engagement in Kempville is, uh, is much, much earlier uh, than the Solicitor General uh, usually uh, contends in terms of a project like this. I'm, I'm very pleased that they've uh, started the engagement so quickly. Uh, I want to thank uh, uh, Mayor Nancy Peckford and their council for being so engaged as well. And as I Response. said last evening, I'm committed to having uh, another public meeting in uh, in the riding, uh, in person, uh, as uh, as was suggested. Uh, we continue to have the engagement, and we're going to continue. Thank you. The supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. I, I think what we just heard was a version of what the residents of Kempville heard last night. A lot of talking points, not a lot of answers. Not a lot of answers of how we can help people who are incarcerated remake their life, how they can be connected with their families, how they can have hope. Nothing. In fact, what this member just told us, Speaker, is that the community is excited about this project, but I would welcome any of us to go on the internet right now and look at the red no jail signs popping up all over Kempville, all over the community. The same folks behind that local campaign that want their MPP to actually listen to them has been unable to meet with him. He has not taken meetings with them. And in fact, Speaker, it got worse. This member has approached Elections Ontario to tell those local community residents that they were engaging in illegal third-party advertising. That's been his level of response to constituents raising questions Order. about this project. Speaker, Question. people deserve better. They deserve answers. We have to make sure that we give people rehabilitation, a hope in life, not a false sales job. That is not what a government with integrity does. I'm going to ask the member to withdraw. Respectfully. Um, the member noted that I was at the meeting last night. I was at the council meeting in June. I was at the first public engagement section, session next last November. I indicated last night and also in a letter last sure. week to the minister. I wrote to the minister last week supporting uh, Mayor Peckford's call for some of those critical questions to be answered. Answers like uh, security costs. Uh, policing costs, the, the funding formula, infrastructure costs. We, we also feel very strongly that there's an agriculture opportunity. You know, this was a site, uh, as the House will remember, that the Liberal government closed uh, to agriculture opportunities. We believe there's a significant portion of that property where the proposed correctional facility will go that could be used for agriculture opportunities, which is something Order. the community wants. We'll continue to work with them. Spons. We'll continue to listen to their concerns and advocate that their questions be answered. Sure. And the next question, the member for Guelph. Good morning, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. Under this Conservative government, climate pollution is going up, not down. Every expert, including the Auditor General, has said that the government's made-to-fail climate plan will not meet their weakened GHG reduction targets. As we see the devastating and tragic consequences of the climate crisis in Ontario and across the country, Ontario desperately needs a real plan for real action on the climate crisis. So, Speaker, 
Can the Premier explain why he failed to instruct his minister to do or announce anything whatsoever on what more Ontario can do to reduce climate pollution while he was attending the climate conference in Glasgow? To reply, the Minister of the Environment, Conservation and Parks. Thank you, uh, Speaker, and it's an honour to rise uh, to answer that question. I was uh, proud to be a part of the Canadian delegation at the COP conference where I spoke about a number of initiatives this government's taking to reduce uh, GHG emissions, like, for example, implementing fuel additives, something the previous government could have done but didn't. That's estimated to take over 300,000 cars off the road. We spoke about adaptation and resiliency, a core concept in Paris. Again, we launched the climate change impact assessment, something the previous government could have done but didn't. We also spoke about the important role transit plays in getting cars off the road and getting people to use active transportation. We're building subways. We're building GO trains, something the previous government could have done but didn't. Again, I was proud to contribute Ontario's voice uh, to the international Response. discussion on combating climate change and appreciate the opportunity to answer. Thank you. Elementary question. Speaker, respectfully, if the minister has any credibility on this file, the government would cancel their plans to ramp up gas plants, which will increase climate pollution by 300 percent. They would cancel Highway 413, which will generate 17.4 million tons of climate pollution and the Bradford Bypass, which will pump 87 million kilograms of climate Order. pollution into Come the inside, atmosphere each and every year. Government Speaker, side, come to these order. kinds of decisions have real-world consequences and will make it Stop the call. The government side will come to order. The official opposition will come to order. I apologize to the member for Guelph on behalf of the House. Start the clock. Member for Guelph. Problem, Speaker. Sometimes the truth can be hard to hear. <laughs> These decisions have real-world consequences, Speaker, and will almost make it impossible for Ontario to meet our climate obligations. Chin? So I'm going to, through you to the minister, I am willing to work with you to pull the Premier's head out of the concrete and cancel these plans, which will significantly increase climate pollution in Ontario. Will he work with me? I'm going to caution the member on his use of inflammatory language, and I'll recognize the Minister of the Environment to respond. Thank you, Speaker. Again, let's talk about the truth. Truth. Ontario. Ontario. Ontario is the only province in this nation on track to meet our GS GHG reduction targets of 30 by 2030. Ms. For Ottawa South will come to order. The leader of the opposition will come to order. Minister of the Environment has the floor. Thank you, Speaker. Again, I know it's hard to hear the truth. That thanks to working with. Algoma, thanks to the electric arc furnace, we're For taking Hamilton a West massive Bank, yes, step done, forward done. in our GHG reduction targets. Thanks to investing in active transportation, investing in public transit, we're taking that step forward. And yes, for new Canadians, like my grandfather, who came over many years ago with the dream of home ownership was very much a reality. For those new Canadians coming to our workforce today, we're making Spons? home ownership a reality for them, which, yes, means investing in transit. Yes, it means building highways so that we can connect people, so that they can get, spend less time in congestion. Thank you. The minister will take his seat. The minister will take his seat. Stop the clock. Order. Please start the clock. The next question, the member for Renfrew, Nipissing, Pembroke. Thank you very much, Speaker. And my question is for the Minister of Energy. Speaker, 
Speaker, I frequently hear from constituents in my riding, as I know members throughout the House hear from theirs, about their energy bills, whether it's heating their home or powering their business. Ontarians count on affordable electricity to get by. My constituents are very happy to see that their bills have stabilized since our government was elected and that hydro rates are no longer skyrocketing as a result of the failed energy policies of the previous Liberal government. Our Conservative government was elected by the people of Ontario because they wanted relief for their families and their businesses. To the Minister, can you tell us what you're doing to make energy more affordable here in Ontario? Minister of Energy. Uh, Mr. Speaker, and thanks to the member from the Ottawa Valley uh, for the question this morning. Uh, I know that for far too long, Mr. Speaker, as a, as a critic for energy in this House, and, and the member was a critic for energy as well, we heard from customers, electricity customers across the province, that electricity prices were soaring and they felt completely helpless, Mr. Speaker. But in 2018, we took office. We began taking steps to reduce the cost of electricity, and we also started taking steps to empower customers more, Speaker. We brought in the Ontario electricity rebate, which is reducing the price of electricity for customers out there by 17 per cent. We provided essential support to ratepayers and business owners uh, during the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, up to the tune of three quarters of a billion dollars in relief, Mr. Speaker. And uh, we introduced uh, customer choice, uh, tier Response. pricing, and time of use price. And we've also introduced the green button, Mr. Speaker, which empowers consumers to take control of their electricity and energy bills in the palm of their hand. Thank you. Thank you. The supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker, and I thank the minister for his answer. I'm extremely pleased to hear about all the initiatives you have brought forward that will help Ontario's hardworking families and businesses. Speaker, while the Liberals spent 15 years tearing down the energy advantage we used to enjoy in Ontario, our government has been hard at work rebuilding our energy sector to bring jobs back to this province and make life more affordable for the people. Minister, could you share more details with the House on the Green Button Standard? and tell us how it will benefit the good people of Ontario. Minister of Energy. Again, thanks to the member uh, from the Ottawa Valley for a great question. Green Button is going to allow customers to save up to 18 per cent, Speaker, on their bills in the palm of their hand or on their laptop or their home computer, Mr. Speaker. They're going to take control, be able to conserve energy, save money using their smartphones. They can do it with you know, when they're on the GO train, they can do it when they're in their office, they can do it at the hockey rink with their kids, Mr. Speaker, keep an eye on their electricity and natural gas bills. Our government believes that people know what's best for their families and businesses, and that's why we're requiring that uh, local distribution companies implement Green Button, and Ontarians can easily access the information that they need using apps and save 18% speaker on their energy bills. This initiative is going to result in lower costs for people out there when it comes to their energy bills. Spons? It's also going to create good jobs in the tech sector. It's part of Ontario's energy advantage, Mr. Speaker, and we're making sure everybody can take advantage of that energy advantage. There Thank you. The next question, the member for Algoma Manitoulin. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Last week, Speaker, Seven white crosses went up in Chiging First Nation. Each cross represents a community member who, was lost, who has lost their life due to an overdose. Speaker, the opioid crisis is getting worse. Communities in my riding are facing higher numbers of deaths and hospitalization due to drug overdoses. In 2018, paramedics responded to the, at least five calls for suspected opioid overdoses on Manitoulin. In 2019, that number grew to 20. And in 2020, it's grown by two and a half times to 48 suspected overdose. In 2021, the numbers are continuing to grow higher and higher. Speaker, enough is enough. We need to act now to prevent more deaths and injury. Community advocates have been clear on what they need, but this government has not done Question. what is necessary. Premier, will your government recognize the severity of the opioid epidemic and declare a public emergency in this province? To reply, the Associate Minister of Mental Health and Addictions. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you for that question. Mr. Speaker, our government does recognize 
the polysubstance overdose issues that we have in the province of Ontario. And we also recognize that Indigenous communities across the province have not only been disproportionately affected by the impacts of COVID-19, but they've also experienced long-standing difficulties in accessing culturally safe mental health and addiction supports before the pandemic. And Mr. Speaker, we also acknowledge that the trauma suffered by Indian residential survivors, as well as the intergenerational trauma to their families and communities, requires a focused commitment to ensure that culturally appropriate services are there for anyone who needs them, no matter where they live in the province. And that's why we recently announced $36 million, Mr. Speaker, to expand access what? to culturally appropriate and safe mental health and addiction supports for Indigenous people and communities across the province of Ontario. Sure. Supplementary question. Again to the Premier, people in my writing are dying because we are not taking action on the drug addictions and mental health. In 2020, Algoma Public Health reported 51 deaths due to overdose, 40 heart hospitalization, 197 emergency department admission. Public Health Sudbury and District announced 106 deaths, 61 hospitalization, and 520 emergency department admission. These are the highest numbers ever reported in both these districts. Recently, Dr. Paul Hergut stepped down as president of CHAT, Citizens Helping Addicts and Alcoholics Get Treatment in Sault Ste. Marie. In his resignation, he said, providers on the ground are doing their best they can, they can with the resources they have. Agencies and providers remain grossly underfunded for what they need in all communities. Question. Will the Premier commit to funding comprehensive local health initiatives to meet the needs of communities and health care providers on the ground? The Associate Minister of Mental Health and Addiction. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker, and once again, thank you for the question from the member opposite. Mr. Speaker, I have traveled throughout Northern Ontario and visited many of those communities, especially uh, many, many trips to Manitoulin and meetings with many of the Indigenous leaders to discuss the needs of those particular communities. Mr. Speaker, as part of the $36 million investment for culturally appropriate and safe mental health and addiction supports for Indigenous communities, more than $16 million in ongoing annual funding will be focused on across governmental investments in Indigenous services supporting the implementation of our Roadmap to Wellness. And this includes $10 million in annualized funding to expand culturally safe and Indigenous-led mental health and addiction services for Indigenous people living both on and off reserve. Mr. Speaker, for far too long, we know that Indigenous peoples in Ontario have been left Response. on their own to navigate completely fragmented and disconnected mental health and addiction systems caused by years of underfunding by previous governments. Mr. Speaker, it's our job, and we will improve the system and build a connect. Thank you. The next question, the member for Scarborough Guildwood. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. This pandemic has been challenging for all Ontarians, but especially students. Children aged 5 to 11 are just on the cusp of receiving approval from Health Canada to receive their vaccine, yet this government has no plan to vaccinate them quickly. Daily, teachers are having to deal not only with the important job of educating our children, but also juggling COVID protocols and outbreaks, which, like in the schools in my riding, classrooms are open one day, close the next. It is known that the pandemic disruption in our schools is resulting in learning gaps for our children. My riding of Scarborough Guildwood has faced some of the worst moments in this pandemic, and our schools have suffered throughout them all. Speaker, why did this Premier cut a half a billion dollars out of the education budget in Question. this month's fall economic statement instead of investing in our schools? Why does this Premier think that cuts to education are the best way for the future of Ontario? Minister of Education to reply. Speaker, that cannot be further. Uh, that is simply not an accurate reflection of the public account, Speaker. Uh, the $500 million increase that was reported in the past, $600 million in the last budget, $230 million in the fall economic statement, uh, in fact, underscores one truth. 
the full economic statement suggests we're actually on track to spend $230 million more than we originally projected, which is already up $600 million year over year. $1.6 billion in COVID resources, $85 million in learning recovery, and a four-time increase over the abysmal investment provided by the former Win Liberal government in mental health. Four-time increase. There is no government investing more in public education. We have a plan in place to continue to support immunization. We have one of the highest vaccine rates for youth in Canada and one of the lowest case rates for youth Response. in this country. We're proud of our work following the best medical advice to keep schools open and keep them safe. Supplementary question. Speaker, packed classrooms are the one truth. It is quite clear that this government prioritizes highways, bypasses, over-education, childcare, and the environment. The FAO's analysis of the government's 2021 budget spending growth, growth projections found that a 1.1 per cent gap between the projected growth in education and what this government is planning to spend is there. What is the plan to close that gap? Ontario's education system is strained. Parents, teachers, students are stressed and tired of the chaos. In my riding of scarborough Guildwood, schools are waiting for funding for the much-needed capital repairs. I recently tabled a petition asking this government to fix or replace St. Margaret's School, where students are having to receive their education in portables contaminated with mold. Question. Speaker, my question to this Premier is, why is his government choosing to invest in highways instead of making schools like St. Margaret's safe? And the Minister of Education respond. Speaker, if only the former Liberals invested in public education when they were in office for 15 years, we wouldn't have had 600 schools close. We wouldn't have students in grade in elementary schools not able to pass the provincial math standard. We would have had a province where we didn't inherit $15 billion of repaired backlog. I mean, indefensible. That is the legacy of the Kathleen Wynne Dalduca Liberals. And I think the people of Ontario put us, uh, elected us to invest in education and to expect accountability for the investment we provide. We are investing half a billion dollars every year to build new schools. We're Fair investing uh, $1.3 billion to renew schools every single year. We're working in collaboration with the Minister of Infrastructure to improve childcare access across Ontario and better schools, modern schools with better ventilation and technology and accessibility. We're doing this every single year because we have so much work to do from the disaster of the 15 years of the former Liberal government. Again, I'll remind members to refer to other members by their writing name or their ministerial title. The next question, the member for Kawarth, Halliburton, Kawartha Lakes Brock. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Digital Government. CBRE, a real estate group that specializes in commercial real estate and in investment, published their Tech 30 report, which lists and ranks the top 30 leading tech markets in the U.S. and Canada. Toronto led all Tech 30 markets for job growth in 2019-2020. This report demonstrates that Toronto is the fastest growing tech market in North America. So, Speaker, through you, can the Minister please tell the House how he is working to build a digital Ontario, making public sector services more modern, modern customer-focused, digital, and data-driven? Aurora, Oak Ridge's Richmond Hill and Parliamentary Assistant. Well, thank you very much, Speaker. And I want to thank the great member from Halliburton Court to Lakes Brock for the question. Thank you very much. Yes, Speaker, it's true. We're building a strong foundation for a digital Ontario and working with tech sector to make that happen. This report is a testament to our commitment to digital job growth in North America, and we will stand by Ontarians to make sure those numbers keep on rising, Mr. Speaker. Unlike, unlike the previous government, we made digital transformation a priority, starting with the creation of an associate ministry of digital government to ensure that this important work gets done. Our government is saying yes to a digital economy and technology-enabled service delivery. For example, Speaker, we unveiled the province's digital and data strategy, which has allowed us to consult with businesses, citizens, and other organizations about how to set up a data authority, which will be responsible for building a modern data infrastructure for social and economic Bonds. benefit for Ontarians. Thank you, Speaker. The supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the Parliamentary Assistant uh, to Finance, 
for the answer and the great work that he has done on this file. And it's good to hear that our government is making digital transformation a priority, leveraging the power of data to make smart decisions and deliver better services is important to this government, and that is why we all need to work together. Could the minister please explain further how our government is engaging the Ontario tech sector? Parliamentary assistant to reply once again. Thanks again, Speaker, and again, thanks to my colleague from Halliburton Court, the Lakes Brock, uh, for the question, and would we'll gladly do so, Speaker. The ministry has started touring tech hubs across the province, most recent in Kitchener-Waterloo. Our government remains committed to listening to industry leaders through roundtable discussions. And recently met with the Centre for International Governance Innovations founder, Jim Balsilli, to learn how their global network of researchers and strategic partnerships provide policy solutions for the digital era. We're seeing firsthand how we can foster learning in the tech sector at public institutions. The Ministry also toured both the main University of Waterloo and the University of Waterloo's Stratford campuses, where we were encouraged to see digital talent being cultivated, including the Cybersecurity and Privacy Institute. It's through collaborative efforts like these Spons. that we can continue to build a digital Ontario. Thank you, Speaker. Question the member for Toronto, Danforth. Thank you very much, Speaker. Speaker, my question to the Minister of Energy. This morning, Efficiency Canada put out its annual report on energy savings programs across the country. It reported that when it comes to saving electricity and saving natural gas, Ontario has fallen far behind its performance prior to the last election. Programs have been cut that would have helped homeowners cut their electricity use and cut their electricity bills. Programs to help cut their natural gas use are stuck in idle. And as you well know, the more gas people use, the higher their bills. Why is the minister not restoring programs? Why is the minister not, not driving programs to help people cut their energy use, cut their energy bills, and cut their carbon pollution? Minister of Energy. Well, thanks uh, for the question, Mr. Speaker. I'm really pleased for the first time since becoming the Minister of Energy to take a question from the opposition about energy issues in the House, Mr. Speaker. And I think it's uh, really important to point out, Speaker, uh, that uh, you know, back when I was the critic for energy, along with uh, my friend from the opposite side, three quarters of the questions in the House every day were about the high electricity rates or high energy costs in the province of Ontario, and you hardly get a question anymore. And it's because of the good work that we've been doing since we became the government in 2018 to start to lower costs for the people of Ontario. Mr. Speaker, as a former Minister of Economic Development, one of the things that I heard when I was first uh, in that role was, why are the electricity costs so high in Ontario? Mr. Speaker, because of the good work that we've done since 2018 to reduce electricity costs and put together a number of different programs that I'll talk Spons. about in the supplementary, Mr. Speaker, including the Ontario electricity rebate, we are now competitive with other jurisdictions for foreign direct investment in our province, and our economy is booming, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Any supplementary questions? Thank you, Speaker. Again to the Minister, notwithstanding that glowing review of his, his own performance, <laughs> uh, people are hard-pressed. You said you'd cut electricity bills by 12 percent in the last election. You haven't done that. Nope. You haven't taken the action necessary to deliver on your own government's climate plan. As you're well aware, the world continues to experience catastrophic climate impacts. This week, people were literally swept to their death off roads in BC by mudslides. Yet Ontario has fallen behind on energy efficiency measures that needs to reduce those carbon pollution emissions, which would also reduce people's energy bills. And we all know people are hard pressed today. The minister's policies are ignoring his own government's climate Question. plan. Why won't the minister help people cut their energy bills, go beyond his green button program, and help them protect all of us from the climate crisis? Minister of Energy. Thanks uh, very much to the member. <laughs> green button. It's one of the programs that we just brought in uh, last month. It's going to require all of our local distribution companies across the province to implement Green Button, which is going to allow 
energy consumers to take control of their own electricity and natural gas bills and save up to eight. 18 percent, Mr. Speaker. That's one of the great programs that we brought in. The Ontario Electricity Rebate, Mr. Speaker, is giving residential, most residential customers across the province a savings of 17 percent on their electricity bill. And I know when we were both energy critics, Mr. Speaker, it was real easy to stand up every day and ask a million questions of the failed energy policies of the previous Liberal government, Mr. Yes. Speaker. But if we had continued yes. on the same trajectory that Stephen Del Duca and the Liberals Response? had us on, Mr. Speaker, our Electricity rates would be going up 7 per cent every year, Mr. Speaker. That's completely unacceptable. We won't go down that road again. Thank you very much. The next question, the member for Stop the Clock. The next question, start the clock, member for Ottawa South. Thank you very much, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. In March 2018, the Ministry of Health mandated public health units to provide school-aged children with vision screening. And this was a really important move and something I've advocated for for many years because, simply put, vision is such a huge part of our children's learning and development. The challenge now, though, is they can get screened, but they can't go to an optometrist to get the help that they need, to get the glasses they need. So, Speaker, through you, will the Premier get his government back to the table and resolve the stalemate with Ontario's optometrists. The Deputy Premier and Minister of Health. Speaker, and thank you very much to the member opposite for the question. Our government continues to be very disappointed that optometrists continue to withhold publicly funded services for youth and seniors while also declining to come back to continue negotiations. Our government has continued to fund OHIP services for seniors and youth, and there's no reason why the optometrist can't continue to provide services while we continue to negotiate. It was the optometrist that wrote to me as Minister of Health and asked, I quote, that you direct the Ministry of Health to immediately commence intensive negotiations with the OAO concerning OHIP optometry fees. Further, the negotiation process must include a mediation and fact-finding process that results in a public report in the event that the, pub the parties are unable to reach an agreement. We said yes to that. We also said yes when the association asked for a mediator to be involved. We also said yes to their choice of mediator, who is a very accomplished and experienced individual. But then, Speaker, the OAO rejected the mediator's terms and walked away from the table. It's now. Thank you very much. The supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. Well, the people who are most disappointed, disappointed are parents right. and seniors. Mm -hmm. So, Speaker, Ontario's vision screening program actually came out of a lot of work with Ontario's optometrists. I know this. And their I See, I Learn program was designed to make sure that children who needed glasses would have them, despite whatever their family's income was. And I know they care about their patients, and I know they really care about kids. So what the government is offering optometrists, it's just not reasonable. So lawyers or doctors, engineers, small business owners would not accept these kind of losses. So what Ontario's children and seniors need from this government is for them to come back to the table with a fair and reasonable offer. Now, so that they can get back to be able to live and to learn. This has gone on way too long. Jen? So, Speaker, will the minister commit to doing this? Minister of Health. Thank you very much. The Ministry of Health and myself as minister have always been ready and willing to go back to the table with the mediator to try and resolve some of these issues that have been outstanding with respect since the previous agreement expired under the Liberal government in 2011. We know that they have suffered losses. We want to negotiate with them. We want children and seniors to be able to receive the eye care that they deserve. So what we're asking, and the Ontario Association of Optometrists knows very well because the mediator reaches out on a weekly basis to the Ministry of Health and to the Association to invite us to come back to the table. So the Association knows very well what is necessary to do in order to do that. The Ministry of Health is ready to do that. We ask the optometrists to come back to the table because I certainly agree with you that children and seniors Response. deserve far better. Thank you. The next question, the member for Niagara Centre. 
Uh, thank you, Speaker. My question through to the Premier. Three years ago, Joe Seriani's son, Ashton, was diagnosed with autism. Now at age six, Joe's family has been forced to pay out of pocket for the therapy he needs due to this government's delays, flip-flops, cuts, and lack of support for children with autism. This year alone, they've paid $60,000 for a variety of therapies. The Syrianis have seen major improvements thanks to their intervention, but it has come at the cost of financial devastation while having to subsidize this government's inaction. Will the Premier make good on his previous commitments, follow the recommendations of the Ontario Autism Program Advisory Panel, and finally implement a needs-based funding system? And to reply, the Parliamentary Assistant Member for Ottawa West Nepean. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you for raising this important question. Uh, and of course, our government is firmly committed to implementing the recommendations of the Ontario Autism Panel and making sure that we have a needs-based system for all of our children uh, who have autism right across the province. And, Speaker, that's why our government also doubled the budget for autism services in Ontario from $300 million to $600 million, the largest amount spent on autism services in Ontario's history. The new Ontario Autism Program is going to provide a range of supports beyond what was previously just offered, including applied behavioral analysis, speech-language pathology, occupational therapy, and mental health supports through our new revised core clinical Response. services program, and that is just one of the four pillars of this new Ontario Autism Program. And, Speaker, I'll be happy to speak further on this new plan in the Thank you. Supplementary. Speaker, what I'm hearing from my constituents who are impacted by this government's neglect of children with autism is that they simply do not trust this government. Joe said to me in an email, and I quote, the Premier is a big bully to these children. Just like a bully will take a child's lunch money, he has taken away their funding and pushed back dates. Speaker, this government promised families like the Syrianis that the wait list would be cleared by the end of March 2020. Instead, as we approach 2022, the wait list has ballooned to 50,000. It's past time to stop playing politics with autism services. When will this government stop ignoring the needs of children with autism and support children like Ashton? Parliamentary assistant. Thank you so much, Speaker. And, and the Premier's commitment to supporting children with autism has been clear. The Premier has appointed two parliamentary assistants to the Ministry of Children, Community and Social Services who have family members with autism who have been involved in this fight for over 20 years. The Premier doubled the Ontario Autism Program budget from $300 million to $600 million. The Premier worked with the autism community, bringing together experts and those with lived experience to design a program designed by the community for the community. Speaker, this program here in Ontario is going to be world class. You will have core clinical services that are coming online as we speak. We will have foundational family services already online and available. Over 15,000 families response. already enrolled in these services. Early years and entry to school and urgent response services. All of this in a new program designed by the community for the community. Our commitment is clear. We're going to continue. Thank you very much. Next question. Once again, the member for Ottawa West Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Municipal Affairs. Speaker, in a move that is a first of its kind in our province, York Regional Council has voted to open up 1,400 acres of Greenbelt for development. The redesignation of proposed land, uh, proposed this proposed this land, protected land, was opposed by York Region staff, the Toronto Conservation Authority, environmental groups, local residents, and the nonpartisan Greenbelt Foundation. The development of these parcels of lands, called the Greenbelt Fingers, will have negative impacts on important water systems and reduce agricultural activity, a key driver of economic activity in the York Region. So, Speaker, the minister received York Region's proposal on Tuesday. So the ball's in his court now. So, Speaker, through you, will the minister do the right thing and defend the Green Belt, or will the government once again cave to special interest? Question. Well, well, speaker, I, I, I think the member sits right across from me. He heard my answer yesterday to the same question uh, from uh, the official opposition. Uh, the member's right. Uh, the regional official plan uh, 7 was just uh, received by the ministry. 
As the member notes, and as I indicated in the House, the Ministry has 120 days to review that application. We're looking at it right now to ensure that it is a complete application and doesn't require further information uh, from York Region. Uh, we're going to take our due diligence, as we do on every regional official plan file. There is a process. We're following the process, Speaker. Here, here. Supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, well, the government has repeatedly stated its intention to protect the Greenbelt. However, allowing development would do exactly the opposite of what the government says its stated intention is. And since coming to the office, you know, the minister is saying, we're a friend of the environment, right. you know, except they ripped up all the charging stations. Yep. They tore up a plan for climate change. Yep. They fired the environmental commissioners. Yep. They want to build Highway 413, spending billions of dollars, paving over thousands of hectares of agricultural land to save people 30 seconds. So the minister knows that if he says yes to this, that it's going to set a dangerous precedent. So speakers for you, once again, will the minister do the right thing and say no to opening up this land and protect our green belt and our environment? Minister of the Environment. Speaker, it's always an honour uh, to get up and, and talk about the environment and talk about uh, measures our government's taken. As I said to that member, Ontario is the only province in this federation on track only to problem. meet our GHG reductions. That member mentioned coal plants. Try listening. That member mentioned it. This is the same member who last week talked about exercising humility in terms of understanding when decisions were made. In 2001, not one, but two premiers prior to when they formed government. Lakeview committed to stop burning coal. That was done. That commitment to stop burning coal was done under a Conservative Premier in the province of Ontario. So perhaps that member could exercise the same humility he espoused just a few days ago. This government will continue investing in transit. This government will continue expanding green space. We'll take no lessons from that previous Response. government, and we look forward to continuing the great work we're doing to protect our environment for future generations. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you very much. That concludes our question period for this morning. The government house leader, I understand, has a point of order. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Just rise on uh, uh, standing order uh, 59. Uh, again, thank you, colleagues, for a, a, a very good week uh, in the House. And uh, I know colleagues are uh, looking forward to the uh, ceremony a little bit uh, later on this afternoon. Um, and I hope that all colleagues will uh, have a, a good, uh, good few days in their constituency. So next week we will uh, begin on Monday uh, with a ministerial. There will be, excuse me, a ministerial statement from uh, Minister Clark on National Housing Day in the afternoon. Government notice of motion number eight. On Tuesday, the 23rd, government in the morning, government notice of motion number eight. Uh, before question period, there will be a tribute to a former member uh, um, who has passed. In the afternoon, government notice of motion number eight. And in the evening, uh, there will be two private members' bills on that day. Uh, uh, colleagues, uh, PMB ballot item 12 uh, for the member of uh, Toronto St. Paul's and ballot number. Ballot item number 13 uh, for the member of London Fanshawe. Uh, on Wednesday uh, in the morning, we will uh, continue with a reply to the speech from the throne in the afternoon, uh, opposition day number five, and in the evening, PMB ballot item uh, 14, standing in the name of the member for University Rosedale, and I'm told that that is to be uh, determined uh, at this point. And, uh, um, should mention to all colleagues, uh, both sides of the House, uh, that we will be discontinuing uh, 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 the practice of uh, uh, whereby if you don't have your private member's bill in time, you will lose your opportunity to debate that private member's bill. Um, this is not to single out the member for University of Rosedale. She's done uh, everything that she was uh, asked to do. Uh, on the morning of November 25th, third reading of Bill 27, uh, working for Workers Act uh, before question period. Uh, on that day, uh, we will observe a moment of silence for a Trans Day of Remembrance. Uh, in the afternoon, third reading of Bill 27, uh, working for Workers Act, and in the evening, ballot item number 15, uh, standing in the name of the member for London North Centre. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you. We have a deferred vote on the motion for second reading of Bill 37. 
an act to enact the Fixing Long-Term Care Act 2021 and amend or repeal various acts. The bells will now ring for 30 minutes, during which time members may cast their votes. I'll ask the clerks to prepare the lobbies.